If you would, stand with me for the honor of reading God's Word. We are going to continue in our series, and we are in Like You Mean It. And today we're going to talk about learn like you mean it. We go to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 and 47. Uh, the foundation of how we structured and started this church. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking bread, and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having fav- favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much that we get the privilege and the opportunity to come before you, Lord, to worship you today. We don't take that for granted. We know in many parts of the world, uh, they don't have this privilege So we thank you for the opportunity. Help us, Lord, now as we begin to look at your word, that we would hear it, that we would receive it, and that that we would apply it to our lives, Father. I'm going to preach plain and clear today. I do understand the judgment on on my life in rightly dividing your word of truth, and I do accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray, and his name that I preach. Amen. Amen. All right. If you have your Bible, I'd ask you to turn to Ezra. Ezra chapter 7. Ezra chapter 7. Uh, in the Old Testament, and uh, we're going to read and, and set up the, the emphasis of learning like you mean it. You ready? So here we go. We're going to go to Ezra chapter 7. We'll start with verse 1. <clears throat> now Ezra, is, he's, he's a scribe and he's a priest, and uh, he was part of, uh, in, from Babylonia, he was in part of the captivity, And they're bringing back and they're allowing the rebuilding of the temple, rebuilding, repairing the walls. And so this is an this is Ezra, uh, a scribe and a priest. Now, after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Moriah, the son of Zariah, the son of Uzziah, the son of Bukai, the son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylonia, and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him all that he asked for the hand of the Lord, his God, was upon him. God's hand was upon Ezra. He was a high chief under Artaxerxes. He was a scribe, a secretary, also committed to the study of the law of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, also known as the Torah. And he was skilled in, uh, in, uh, in teaching it and recording it, scribing it, And he was a priest and a scribe. And there went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, the king, some of the people of Israel and some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers and the temple servants. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem for the good hand of his God was on him. You see that? That's repeated twice. God's hand was on him. When God is for you, who could be against you? Right? It's always good to be, to be walking with the Lord and to have God's hand on you. Now, look at verse 10, the focus. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to Teach his statutes and rules in Israel. If you have your Bible out, I would underline or circle these words. Study, do it, or practice it, whatever your translation says there, and the word teach. Okay? And we're going to talk about those three uh, in the message today. Let's start with, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of Moses. He set his heart to do it. It mattered to him. It was important to him. God's word, it was important enough to commit his life to studying it. 
Because we have to be committed into knowing God's Word. The only way you're going to know God's Word is if you read it. Simple. Study. You've got to get in to God's Word. If you're going to know what God's Word says, you have to read it. So uh, we're, we're kind of using analogies of sports, football, and this can apply to any kind of sports, but, but uh, like football, it's football season right now and a lot of football going on. And, uh, and before the season begins, the coach is going to give all the players, they're going to get a playbook, right? They're going to get a playbook. And they're going to have plays. There's offense and defense, and there's different formations in the defense. There's different plays in the offense and different ways to line up, different assignments, different ways to block. And before the season starts, you've got to study and know the playbook. True? you got to know the playbook. you got to know when the quarterback calls out a play, you've got to know what that means. And the only way you can know what that means is if you have... Study the playbook that you know it. You have to know it. You got to know where you're supposed to be, what you're supposed to do. In basketball, you got plays drawn up and whatever. You got to know where you're supposed to be on the floor at the time. If you're supposed to set the pick, if you're supposed to roll, whatever. You you got to know it. Same thing in baseball, right? You got to know. You got to you, you you got to know the signs, right? You got to learn it. You got you got just got to learn the signs. You got to when that when that coach is going. You got to know what that means. And the only way you know what that means is if you study it and learn what that means, right? And so if we're going to be effective, the first step in our walk of faith is we have got to get the Word of God in us. We've got to know it. We've got to know our playbook. The Bible is our playbook. It's our assignment. It tells us how to live. It tells us how to behave. It tells us what we're supposed to do. It tells us, it gives us our assignment for life. True? And so the only way you're going to know what you're supposed to be doing is if you read the Bible. You've got to know the Bible. So let me ask you, how often are you reading your playbook? Do you just have one to have one? Oh, yeah, I got a Bible. Is it a decoration? Is it to make it look good on your office desk? Do you carry it around and think it's some magic protection object to where? <laughs> Can't touch me, Satan. I've got the Bible in my hand. Hmm? Well, how, so are, are, are you engaged in knowing what the Word of God says? Or is your heart committed to knowing God's Word? Is it like Psalm, Psalm 119, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your Word. In 2 Timothy, the charge is to study, to show thyself approved a workman that does not need to be ashamed. So you got to get it in. You got to learn the playbook. You got to know what you're supposed to do. So tell, tell your neighbor, say, you got to get it in. You got to get it in. You got to get it in. That wasn't too strong right there. We got to do this again. I ain't going to let that slide. Here we go. You got to look at your neighbor. Look at your other neighbor. Maybe you didn't like that neighbor. Look at your other neighbor and say, you got to get it in. You got to get it in you. You got to get the word of God in you. You got to get it in. You got to learn it. You got to study it. You got to know it. You got to get it in. But whoa now, let's stop right there. Let's we again stop there. You got to do it. You got to get it out. You got to get it in so that it can flow out. So, like, if you know to block, but you do not block, does that help the team? No. So, just knowing the playbook, knowing what you're supposed to do, and knowing where you're supposed to be is different than executing the play. True? So, if I know that I'm supposed to block right, but I block left, what happens? There's a problem. If the coach gives me the sign to bunt, but I swing away, what happens? There's a problem. If the coach calls a play, and I don't know where I'm supposed to be on the floor, and I go somewhere else, and I mess it up, what's going to happen? It's going to be a problem. So just because you know the play doesn't necessarily mean you're going to execute it. Now, if you go out there and you do absolutely nothing, 
And you run over to the coach, and the coach says, what were you supposed to do? Well, I was supposed to block right, sir. He said, well, did you do it? No. What would you do? I just stood there. <laughs> well, what good is that? Right? You'll be on the bench is where you're going to be. You're going to be no good to the team. Just knowing what you're supposed to do isn't enough. You have to execute it. So knowing the Bible's good, and you got to know the Bible, and you got to know what it is. You got to know the playbook. But if you don't execute, it does no good. Hmm? That's what Jesus said. He gave the example to his disciples. He was, he was, it, was the, it was the time where he's going to wash the disciples' feet, and he sets an example, and he says this. In John chapter 13, verse 12, it says... <clears throat> When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? Let's go on to the next. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you, what? An example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, amen, amen, truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his, than, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now watch, if you know these things, Blessed are you if you do them. You see? You see that? You have to know what to do. You got to know the playbook. You got to know the route you're supposed to run. You got to know what you're supposed to do. You got to know what you're supposed to do. But then you've got to go do it. You've got to execute it. Do you see that? Blessed are you if you do it. Another time Jesus said this. He said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and what? Keep it or practice it or do it. Jesus also, you all know this story. Many of you all know this story. He gave a little, little example of what it means to, to be someone who is wise. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 24, we read, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew right and but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock and everyone who hears these words of mine and what does not do them, does not execute the play, does not carry that, does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Do you see that? You see, Ezra had set his heart to study the law and... Do it. I feel like we have missed this up, messed this up in the um, church today. Because I'm afraid that many of you all think that discipleship is knowing the Bible and not obeying the Bible. I think that what we have said as discipleship in the church world is us sitting around talking about the plays and not executing the plays. Well, you know, what do you think that means to you? Well, to me, it means we're supposed to wash people's feet. Well, to me, it means this. And you all discuss, and we'll talk about what it all means to us, and then we'll go, ah, wouldn't that be a great study? And you never go serve anybody. Because what Jesus said there is, if I'm willing to humble myself and wash your feet... Jesus humbled himself and put him in a role of a servant. Do you know how beneath that was for him to do? He was way far above that. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. He, there is, 
If anyone should have never washed someone's feet, it would have been him. But he humbled himself and he washed their feet. He said, I'm giving you an example of how to do it. Now go do it. Go execute. Humble yourself. Be a servant. Be willing to serve people. Don't, do, never think that someone is, that you're better than anyone else. You better be willing to serve with a humble heart. He says, the person who hears my words and acts on them, they're the wise man. That we need to be accomplishing and doing and, and reading God's word, not just for information, but life transformation. And so we need to say, this is what God's word says for me to do, so here's what I need to go do. Not just talk about it and say, boy, isn't that great? I tell you what, I got a lot of good stuff in the Bible today. Oh, so rich, you know. And then go to work and, and be the most miserable, hateful, ornery person around. How do we read God's word but yet still live in misery? I, I don't know. Because I, 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 I say the reason for that is, is that we're not activating the game plan. We, we, many of us know what we're supposed to do, but we don't do it. Right? So we know we're supposed to forgive, but we don't forgive. We know we're supposed to have our eyes fixed completely just if we're married on our spouse and not lust, but there's many roaming eyes out there. We know we're supposed to not be greedy, but we just we lust after things. We like to talk about it. But then when it comes to activating and executing the play, we don't do it. Because we think if we just know God's word, that makes us spiritually mature. And it doesn't. You can memorize scripture and fail to execute the play. Do you know who else can memorize scripture better than you can? Satan. He can memorize scripture. He doesn't execute it well. And so we read what we're supposed to do. The seven, we talk about the seven. Engage, worship, like you mean it. We'll read about worship and we'll talk about worship. Oh, yeah, we need to worship. We need to worship. Worship's important to me. I come here every Sunday, but is your heart really here to worship? Do you really worship like you mean it? Are you singing to the Lord who saved you like you mean it? Are you devoting your life to him like you mean it? Prayer, do you pray like you mean it? Do we actually read the Bible to go apply it and do it? Or do we just read it to check off something and make ourselves feel good? Read my Bible today. Do we serve and humble ourselves? Do we give? Oh, I, I love it when the, when the spiritually mature... Uh, withhold their tithes and offerings when they're not thinking things are going the way it should. <laughs> that's, that's real spiritual maturity right there. Do we invite people like we mean it? Are we actually out there engaged in sharing our faith? Does our Facebook reflect obedience to God or are we cussing people out on Facebook? Are we going to work loving our... our, our what, what are we doing? Are we doing it? Now, what happens when you mess up? Write this down. When you mess up, you fess up. Right? Right? When you mess up your face, when you, when you act like a fool, you, you, you say, I'm sorry, you know? Now, sometimes you execute, the, you try to run the play right, but you just don't do it right. How many of y'all ever done that? You've tried to plot, you just didn't do it right, you messed it up, right? Pray for me, I'm, 
I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to coach a little, little basketball team again, and I tell you what, I get so frustrated sometimes. I get out there, and I was like, John, did I act crazy over on the sideline? Help me, tell me, tell me if I'm, 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 get there, get there, get there, over here. You know, I'm trying to get them in, in place, and I'm thinking, I just, calm down. I'm pastor. I can't throw my clipboard. <laughs> Too hard. <laughs> we try to execute. If we read the Bible, we read the Bible so that we can put it into practice. Okay? So we read the Bible, we get it in so that we can get it out. We got to get it out. And then when we get it out, guess what? He said that Ezra had set his heart to study God's word and do it and to teach it to the people of Israel. Teach it. Once you get it in you and it flows out of you, you need to get it into others. You need to teach it. How many teachers do we have in the house today? You're a teacher, you're a teacher, you're a teacher by by trade, you're just you've you teach you've teach you've taught Bible study somewhere. How many people, teachers? Okay, you learn more than the students, right? Teacher always will learn more than the students, okay? Uh, And so when you teach it, when you teach it, not only does that help somebody else, but it helps you too. There should always be someone in your life that you're pouring into. If you're a believer in Jesus, and you're walking it, and you're getting it in, and it's flowing out of you, there should always be someone that you're bringing along with you and helping them learn what it means to follow Jesus. Parents, your first pupils are your kids, right? As parents, we invest in the lives of our kids, and we model for them, and we teach them, and we instruct them, and we pour into them, right? But if we're a follower of Jesus and we love him and we serve him and we're letting the word of God flow out of us, guess what? There ought to be uh, someone else that's in our circle of influence that we help bring along. Maybe it's somebody that doesn't know Jesus, that you're praying for, that you're witnessing to, and that one day you lead them to Christ. How awesome would that be? If you've never helped someone meet Jesus, you need to do it. So, if you've never done that, let me give you a life go. You want a bucket list? That sometimes seems to be popular. i got to have a bucket list. You want a bucket list? Here's your bucket list. Help lead someone to Jesus before you breathe your last breath. That your existence, the air that you breathe, at some point you help someone else connect to the everlasting Father. And then those who are, are baby Christians and, and they're learning and they're growing, walk with them and instill and impart and, and model for them what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You know why we don't do that often? Because we get stuck on one. We know it. We never do it. We never do it. We'll never teach it. Why? Because we get it in, but we never get it out. And so what the world sees is this. The world sees people professing faith in an almighty God, yet living in depression, anxiety, anger, and bitterness. And they say, why would I want that? Why would we read about a God who gives us hope, but yet live in despair? Why would we read about a God that calls us to abandon everything and follow him and we just sit there? Why would we read the stories of scripture and be amazed of the peace that God offers but yet still live in misery? Why would we know the things that God offers his children, but yet never activate it and execute it in our lives? Why? Why do we do that? 
Why do we read and not activate? Why do we get it in and not let it flow out of us? Church, we, we, he's the living water. Jesus is the living water. And we drink from the fountain of living water, and it ought to flow out of us. Do you know that there are people dying all around us, and they are hopeless, and they're drinking after the world's drinks, and they still remain thirsty? They're eating what the world sells them, and it never satisfies their hunger. And we have the very bread of life, the water of life, and his name is Jesus But yet we as Christians sometimes, we, we get on our little holy huddles and we just talk to one another about how, how awesome God is and how wonderful God is. And oh, we just learned a lot about Bible study. And then we leave and we're never changed. We still have anger in our heart, unforgiveness, bitterness, lust, pride, envy, jealousy, still in us. You know what the world needs to see? They need to see a group of Christians who are actually letting it flow out of them. Of what God's put in them. And someone looks at your life and they say, man, I don't know. I know you're going through a lot of stuff right now. But it seems like you have so much peace. How do you do it? I know you have a right to be angry and you've been hurt and you've been wrong. But somehow you've... You've managed to forgive. How did you do that? I know you're struggling and going through a hard moment right now, but it seems like you have so much love in your heart. How do you do that? I know we have the same job, and I hate my job, and I know our job isn't fun, but it seems like you have joy when you come to work. How do you do that? When we as people of faith walk in the same misery and depression and complaining and all of the hate and all this stuff like the world does. It's no wonder nobody wants it. I hope you're not just a Sunday only Christian. Do you all think that just coming to church on Sunday is going to get you by? I hope not. Now I appreciate the compliment. I appreciate you thinking, boy, Grant, he preaches so good, I never need to read the Bible all week long. I mean, I get everything I need on Sunday. I mean, I appreciate that. Thank you. That's good for my ego. That's horrible for you all. Horrible for you all. Right? How many of y'all like to, to eat every day? At least three times. Four or five or whatever. How many of y'all like buffets? You like Chinese buffets? I like Chinese. I like some Chinese buffet. Give me an amen. Amen. (laughs) But that's not the only meal I eat all week long. Right? I eat again. But some of you, you're, you're, you're dying from spiritual starvation. You never read God's word. And then the other of you, when you just stop at two, you're waterlogged. Get all this information in you. And you're so spiritual. And you're so legalistic. And you're so fundamental. You walk around, sloshing around, <sighs> point around everybody. Like everybody's not this, everybody's not that. And you're no good to anybody. You can rattle off a lot of things. But let's get it in so that we can let it flow out and get on somebody else and teach and lead somebody else to who Jesus is. What do you think? Can we learn it like we mean it? Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful.